that. We're in a period of time where uh, mental health and everything is, there's so much being talked about it and, and so much good being done, but there's still a long way to go. Uh, where do you guys kind of sit with this particular story and how do you hope that it kind of raises the right conversations? Well, um, one of the un or not often stated enough issues is the, is the link between sexual abuse and mental abuse, mental health. Um, to be honest, people are quite familiar with the, the act for want of better expression. And we, we, you know, we, it's, not, it's not a new idea. What is a new idea, I believe, and I, this, this is what I think is so important about this film, is that it, it, it shows the collateral damage that someone like me and other people in my position have been, I hope to say, not are, capable of it. And uh, without, sometimes without realizing it, but more importantly, sometimes you do. And you're, you're able to shut off those emotions and, uh, and you don't care. And it's an ability not to care, which is a rather unenvi unenviable trait, which is born of the need for, to shut yourself off from the rest of the world. It's almost a survival instinct. So it's wonderful if you want to direct someone to achieve a particular goal, pretty good at doing that, but you leave, you lay waste to everything around you to achieve that goal, which is unenviable. So one fits with a family and one doesn't. And I think the mental health issues that you carry throughout your life as a consequence of sexual abuse is the issue. And that needs to be addressed now, and that's what I hope this film will do. Yeah. For you, Julian, I mean, as a filmmaker, you, you must know when you read the script and, and, and meet David for the first time how, how important it is to tell mm. the story right. But you're backed up by such a wonderful uh, screenwriter as well. I mean, yeah. did, you, did you feel that sense of uh, how important it was to tell the story in the, in the right uh, way? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and also, but comes with that is that you don't want to preach to the audience. You want to... It has to work as a story as well. They have to be characters that you want to invest in and uh, in the end feel compassionate about and I think you know compassion is quite an interesting part of it really because somebody who behaves incredi apparently incredibly badly and then when you, be you begin to piece together why that is I think that's what one wants people to feel. Um, so yeah I mean it, it, it's, a, it's a pull between guess you've got to tell the story because it's vital that people see it but also uh, you know I was intrigued by many interesting aspects of David's life from the, the highs and the lows to the successes in the city and why he was so spectacularly su successful and appeared to have no fear and yet others you know wilted under the same pressure and and how ch one's childhood forges one's adult behavior are all kind of fascinating topics really um, to look into and something anybody can relate to even in less extreme circumstances than this. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about your, your cast. Obviously Mark leads the way and you've got the two great young actors uh, playing David at different parts of his life, but Emily and Dugray and Anno and even Alistair and the guys down the list, yeah. all, all fantastic. I mean, you must have been delighted with the ensemble and everyone was so keen to tell the story in the same way that you did. I did, I was very, and you know, uh, I worked with fantastic casting director Dixie Chasse who put an awful lot of very very good people in front of me and it was very hard to choose you know to find the right right person um, and you know Mark Stanley in the end he's he's a brilliant quite unsung actor at the moment I think I fully expect him to be um, you know a superstar soon but he's he's there's something really authentic and truthful about his performance and very rooted in reality and that just felt utterly right for this and Emily's just got this extraordinary presence and uh, ability really uh, and the chemistry between the two of them became very important yeah for you David I mean uh, has it been a cathartic um, uh, method, if you like, of watching the film and seeing it. Have you been able to watch it all the way through? Have you enjoyed seeing what Julian and the guys have, have brought to, to not just to your story, but to the to the film version of, of your story? Yes, I've, watched, I've seen it a num quite a few times. Mm. Um, it's different every time. Sometimes I feel st st strangely numb. Other times, it's like the first time I ever saw it. There are some scenes in the film that leave me riven every time, in particular, and a thrill scenes. Uh, of my mother. I can't help that. I just cannot seem to get over that bit. Um, but it's, it's, it's just a, a hugely churning moment every time I sit down. Um, I'm generally every muscle tenses and I get up exhausted. Um, but I've just got to make sure it does what I attend. I'd like it, I should yeah. say, 
to do what I intend. And then I'll, I, I don't mind spending my story, um, but I don't want to spend it cheaply. I wanted to try and do some good. Yeah, I did want to ask you actually, in a, in a strange way, I'm, I'm always been fascinated by Everest and you've you climbed it five times. How has that experience been for you, not just in terms of doing it for the NSPCC and raising all that money, but in terms of the actual physicality of it? How have you managed to, how did you kind of psych yourself up each time to do it, those those five different times? In many ways, it's a, it's a real parallel to the mental health issue. Yeah. Because I was able to turn off as I did in the trading scenes, what they were intended to demonstrate was an ability to shut out and just do. And then to the exclusion of all else, it's less fearlessness, but that ability. And so Everest was, I'm going to do it, and I don't care what anybody else thinks, including my family. To the extent, Vanessa, once I used to give her an envelope to be opened in the event of my death, as I stepped out the door, five times I did that. And she said to me, only you, would be able to do that and not see what you're doing. And then I'd get on the plane and I'd fly to there and I'd be sitting there thinking, God, she's right, because I'd come back into the real world again. Uh, physically, I just turn off. I don't care. If you have to reach a point where you don't care, you die. I know it sounds dramatic. I don't mean it to sound that, but you have to. And I, my childhood developed an ability to say, don't care, and it's not an enviable trait. Yeah. And just finally for you, Julian, I mean, what's it, what's it been like being around David and telling his story, but also being around him as a, as a man? It must have been a, quite a rewarding experience, I can imagine. Yeah, I mean, obviously at first it was daunting. My usual instinct is to have as much distance as possible for the person. Um, just so that you've got a freedom to, to, to do it. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't to be on this project. Uh, and actually, I think in the end, it was, in, it was incredibly useful and kept us all honest. The, the, the fact that you know this story was living next to us you know make, doing this make-believe version of it made, made it more truth made it more believable and you know and, and authentic I hope and that's really what one hopes for the film and I, I hope that comes off comes across in it yeah fantastic well I wish you all the best of it it's, it's a fantastic piece of work thank you so much thank you time. cheers thank you. ladies and gentlemen you're watching hey you guys Hey, you guys, huh? Hey, you guys. Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed. Yeah. Nice. Hey!